Again, welcome all of you here tonight, as well as those that have joined us on live stream. These, as you know, these are times of uh, fellowship and mutual edification. Amen. They're very precious times. This will be our 23rd uh, lesson in the book of Amos. We'll be in the fourth chapter, verses 10 through 12. Thus far, in this chapter, three judgments have been mentioned. The first has been want of bread or a, a famine. And that was a judgment that God announced through Moses would happen in Levit Leviticus and Deuteronomy. The second judgment was that rain was withheld and sometimes given discreetly to one city, not to another, one field, not to another. That also was mentioned under the law. It was called the heavens becoming brass. And then the third was a, a blight, a blasting, and a mildew. And what grew was destroyed what, by the palmer worm. And that kind of judgment was also announced in the law. And I give you the, the text for all of these. That, uh, that Moses told the people, if you depart, these things will happen. And now here, hundreds of years later, they, they had departed, and these judgments are happening, just like Moses said. Isaiah prophesied of a judgment like this in Isaiah 27, about the palmer worm. Ezekiel prophesied about it, too. In Ezekiel 17, and Joel did also in Joel, the first, first chapter. And these warnings were uh, covered a period of more than 640 years. So you get an idea about God here. See, God, God doesn't delight in having to work like he's working here. And so he sends out laborers and alerts people, tells them, first of all, what'll happen. You, you depart from me, and here's what'll happen. But over time, sin hardens people. Now, some people don't know this. Sin hardens people. And pretty soon they're disobedient, and they don't think anything about it at all. The prophets were sent by God rising up early. That is, they were always ahead of schedule, so to speak, to, to, to stop something from happening. But it was to no avail, and Israel moved deeper and deeper in sin, further and further from God. Now, before the time of the judges, this word encapsulated that time, and it's mentioned in Judges 2, I'm showing here that God continually chastened, worked, chastened, worked, and didn't, it didn't stop the things from happening. Judges 2, 14 through 15. The anger of the Lord, the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he delivered them into the hands of spoilers that spoiled them, and he sold them into the hands of their enemies round about, <clears throat> so they could not law any longer stand before their enemies, whithersoever they went out. The hand of the Lord was against them for evil, as the Lord had said, and as the Lord had sworn unto them, and they were greatly distressed. And actually, this is true of every backslider. Now, they may not tell you, but it's hard to backslide because you got hedges of thorns and like the Lord, like Israel here. So when you see someone drop off the deep end, don't be going around blaming people for this happening. Yes, amen. 
Say, no, if we'd have done just, we'd have just done a little better, that wouldn't have happened. If we hadn't have been so critical, it wouldn't. This is all just a lot of talk. God doesn't let things like this happen without sufficient warning to turn the people. Now, aside from these various chastenings, which were quite numerous, sometimes thousands were slain. You read through the, just the book of Numbers alone. Be the plagues, thousands of people were slain. In addition to that, they served Eglon, the king of Moab, for 18 years. And seven years they were delivered into the hands of the Midianites for seven years. And for 40 years they were delivered over to the hand of the Philistines. I'm showing you here all the, all the things that preceded our, our text here. So, all right, that ends now. Any controversy on this subject, this, this terminates it. It should be apparent that men cannot be changed by blessing or by threats or by judgments. Amen. None of those change sinners' character. Yeah. Amen. That's what God's demonstrating this. See, about the time you get this message, it sounds good to hear about a Savior. Amen. That there's a man been appointed by God that can resolve this whole matter. Yes. Amen. And it involves a new creation. See, sin has so thoroughly corrupted man that he cannot correct his course. Yeah. Now, he's, in, he's showing you here in Israel. He's, what more could, he asked Israel one time, what more could I have done? Yeah. The man can't be changed that way. So you can tell all the counselors and all the psychiatrists they can go home and find some honest means of employment. Stop deceiving the people. You can't change people that way. Amen. All right, here's our text, verses fourth chapter, verses 10 through 12. I have sent among you the pestilence after the manner of Egypt. Your young men of ice have I slain with the sword and have taken away your horses, and I have made the stink of your camps to come up into your nostrils. Yet... Have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord? I have overthrown some of you, as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and ye were as a firebrand plucked out of the burning. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord? Therefore thus will I do unto thee, O Israel, and because I will do this unto thee, Prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. Yeah, that's where that text comes from. Yeah. Hmm. Long sufferings over. Yes. Time to pray over. That's how bad it was. Yeah. See, sin had de so desensitized the people that God had to tell them what he'd done. They knew this; these things had happened, but they, they didn't associate them with God. There were prophets then, just like there are now. The ones then came from the devil. The ones now came from the devil. God didn't send that tornado. God doesn't do stuff like that. Only good things come from God. Bad things only come from the devil. There's still people spouting this message. They're right straight out of hell. This is not the truth. Or else you're going to have to destroy a good part of the Bible. You're going to have to go and apologize. Noah's going to have to, God's going to have to apologize to Noah. Sodom and Gomorrah, things like this, see. No, this God does do things like this, Amen. but people don't recognize it. Even if it is Satan who does carry out some of these mandates, God can't, Satan can't raise his finger unless God lets him. Amen. He's got to ask permission yeah. to do anything. Uh -huh. 
And if they're people of God, then the Savior today, he intercedes for them. That the faith won't fail. So note this, God had to tell them what he'd done. Because they hadn't associated with himself. That's the kind of obtuseness. Hosea talk, talked about this, being dull, not able to see things. Hosea 2.9. For she did not know, he's talking about Israel, she did not know that I gave her corn and wine and oil and multiplied her silver and gold. That came from me, does it? Which they prepared for Baal. <laughs> They gave Baal. <laughs> they gave Baal the credit. Yeah. Oh, we got to kind of bring it up to date. You know? They gave the Bible college the credit. Yeah. Uh -huh. oh. yeah. The convention the credit. Yeah. The denominational headquarters the credit. The 12-step plan the credit. Yeah. Uh -huh. This stuff is still going on. Right. Still happening. I, I gave them this. What did they do? They offered it up to Baal. So therefore, God said, "This is what I'm going to. This is what I what I'm going to do. This is what first you're going to tell them what I've done. What I've done. I have sent among you the pestilence after the manner of Egypt." I treated you, the people I chose, the people I took out of Egypt, the people I cultured, the people I fed. I gave you a pestilence like I did to Egypt. Yeah. Getting pretty bad when the Lord has to treat his people like he treats the world. Yeah. Of course, the preachers have helped make this sensible. They say, we're just like everybody else. We're all the same. We're all sinners. We're just forgiven ones. What does that do? That means you can't tell this stuff that he's saying here. Does not make any sense to people that swallow that? I sent the pestilence. The word pestilence, it actually means murrain. It's the same word used for the plague sent the cattle in uh, Exodus. Here's what he, it's the same thing. He's, I sent a pestilence, it's talking about it on their, on their flocks and probably on some of them too. Here's how it was stated in Exodus. Behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thy cattle, which is in the field, upon the horses, upon the asses, upon the camels, upon the oxen, and upon the sheep. There shall be a very grievous murrain. It was a disease. They died, the cattle died. He said, all right, I'm going to do that to you, Israel. You wanted to worship other gods. That was a judgment against Egypt's gods. Yeah. So this is what I'm going, to do. I'm going to give you, what I gave Egypt. Mm -hmm. This is an agricultural nation now. This, these weren't city folk. Yeah. After the manner of Egypt. <laughs> Why? Because you've been acting like Egypt. That's why. It was very appropriate in Egypt. They worshipped calves. Yeah. Yeah. And Israel was a worshipping calves, too. That's right. It was also appropriate because Israel was oppressing their own people. That's right. Yeah. Amen. Amen. After the man of Egypt. See, this kind of dullness is still found among God's professed God's people. God has to treat them like he treats the heathen. He has to judge them like he judges the world. They've descended so far down the spiritual spectrum that he has to treat them like he treats the world. This is God. But we're learning about God here. This is what God does. I have, I have slain your young men. At your military men, your soldiers. Now that was promised under the law. God said he's going to do this. Leviticus 26, 25. 
He said he'd bring a sword upon them that would avenge his covenant and be against the young men. Jeremiah said, Therefore I am full of fury. I am full of the fury of the Lord. I am weary with holding in. This is God talking. He said, you mean that means like he's exasperated? Yeah, that's what it yes. Yes, that's what it means. He's tired, it's holding it in. Can't do it anymore. I'm weary with holding it in. I'll pour it out upon the children abroad and upon the assembly of the young men together. I did this. Oh, the Israelites probably thought some enemy did that, you know. He said, I did it. I struck the Twin Towers. Yeah. Uh-huh. Well, you think this isn't the truth? Uh-huh. I sent that tsunami wave. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All this is under my yes. jurisdiction. I had those earthquakes. I caused those earthquakes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I caused them. Got that bird flu and all that. I'm doing that. Don't think for one minute that Satan is free to operate at will. He is not. He actually works for God. Quite unwillingly. He can't do a thing. When Jesus was here, did Satan ever attack Jesus? Did he ever attack any of his disciples before that fateful night when Peter denied were, the, his, were Jesus' disciples ever persecuted while he was here? Why weren't they? Satan couldn't touch them. Yeah. When, Jesus, when Jesus walked out to that gathering in the morning, he says, I know who you are. Yeah. You're the Holy One of God. Please don't destroy us before the time. Yeah. Yeah. Satan didn't lift a finger against Christ. How come it seems like he's free today? God's let him loose. I'm telling you the Amen. truth here. God's let him loose because the church has been dilatory. It's not done its job. Amen. See, Satan, he's wanted, he's wanted to get in there all along. He's wanted to harass God's people all along. Now, God's go, go ahead. You can't destroy him, though. You work him over a little bit. Even though they'll call out on me. I've slain your young men. And I've taken away your horses. <laughs> that was it. Like, that'd be like today. He said, I took away your airplanes and tanks. I took them away. Yeah. That was Judah. This thing that you're speaking of, that the devil can't do anything without the Lord giving him permission, this blows a hole in the doctrine of the free will of man. Hmm. Because if they, they think that men can do whatever they want, the, the starting point of this is God casts a vote, Satan casts a vote, and you cast a deciding vote. But the this thing of free will, the, it makes it even more far-fetched when you learn that Satan can't do anything without the Lord That's telling right. him that he can do so. Mm-hmm. so it may seem that the wicked are prospering, the wicked have it better than we do, but those are the people that he's worked over because God has told them that he could. That's right. That's exactly it. Mm-hmm. It's, I've taken away your horses. Now that's tied in with the young men. Moses sang about this. He says, the horse and the rider. He is thrown into the sea. Well, that's what he's saying there. I took away your horses. You, you couldn't get away. You couldn't, you couldn't sally forth into the battle, and you couldn't make a clean escape. I took away your horses. God can take away a person's strongest traits and abilities. He can have cultured this ability or that ability, become very strong and influential in this area and that area, and God, with one word, can just strip him of all his abilities, take away his horses, so to speak. And I made the stink of your camps come up in your nostrils. That's kind of a crude, <laughs> crude language. The idea is that 
There's slain people all around, and the, the ground is strewn with corpses, and I made you... This is a one little mouse die in your house, and you smell it all over the place. Death has a dis odor to it, an obnoxious odor to it. You can imagine all the dead animals with disease, died of disease, people killed and strewn all around. I made the stink of it come up in your nostrils. You couldn't get away from it. Took your appetite away from you. You couldn't do anything about it. You were being ravaged so much. He said, would God do something like that? Well, listen, that's what he said. Yes, he does things like that. Stench filled the air. Now, there's also a kind of a stench that spiritual death has. People dying spiritually. And some, I thought God has allowed the stench of this to come up in the nostrils of the professed church. Or oh, they do their best to deal with it, but it's a pain in the neck. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, Brother Paul. Even if you remove yourself from the situation, there are times when that stench just sticks around. Oh, and stays yeah. around. It's like if you, if you were in a house of uh, someone who smoked for decades upon decades upon decades, and they stopped or they moved out, you go into that house and it's still going to smell still there. Like that yeah. for years and years and for yeah. years. And thus you rip up everything, get it all out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I made it. Yeah. I wouldn't let you forget what's happened. That's what he's saying. You might have got over it, regrouped, taken a couple of counseling sessions and regrouped. No, I didn't. I didn't let you do this. As I said, there's a there's an obnoxious odor to spiritual death. When you're around someone that's spiritually dead, it's it's an irritating. It's not like I hate you irritating. It's a clash of nature irritating. We're kind of allergic. <laughs> Have an allergic reaction uh, to it. And actually, the saved are smell bad to the unsaved. That's what 2 Corinthians 2.16 says. We're a saver of death unto death unto them that are not saved. They get, we stink to them too. So it has an effect on not only you, but it has an effect on what the Lord will do. Remember, Jesus could do no many, many mighty in, work in, in those areas That's where they right. didn't believe. That's right. But it has an effect on you. Mm -hmm. Amen. So when you like you're going to do some kind of a evangelistic work, as they say, for the Lord, you got to check out whether a work can be done there or not. God may say, nah, mm -hmm. don't go up there. Yeah. Don't go to Asia. Mm -hmm. We're gonna let you, no, not to Bethania, you can't go there. Yeah. Later the time was right and you were able to go. But there's some places you just can't, you waste your time. You may live there, work hard, preach hard. Nothing ever happens. Nothing ever happens. Year after year, decade passes. Two decades passes. Pretty soon you spent your whole life. Yeah. Nothing has happened. Why? You were in the wrong place. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Now, some of us had to, we, we found this out, you know. In a sense, it was humiliating, but once we knew, we got out of there. Yeah, Brother Gibbon, I remember I just came back to the Lord, and I was all excited. I wanted, I thought, we should have a revival. So I came to you, and I said, we should have a revival. And you looked at me, and you said, well, would it help us or hurt us? <laughs> I didn't understand it at the time, but I understand it now. But it would have actually have been, it would have hurt us. We would have been, it would have been depressing, kind of like. Yeah. We have a revival, and nobody show up. <laughs> Like, how would that help? Yeah. But I, I didn't... Read, read about the One man said he, he had a Holy Ghost revival scheduled. And I said, how do you schedule a Holy Ghost revival? I'd like to... See, you, you'll find out there are some people God can't stand to be around. 
He just leaves. Jesus was that way. He just, someplace he just left. Yet after all that, see, those are pretty, those are very difficult things that we just read about. Yet he said, you've not returned to me. You can't imagine anything being more extreme. So that tells you, for a return to God to be facilitated, there's some kind of special work that has to be done yeah, in the person right. by God. Because yeah, you, you couldn't have exacted, if, we, if you were given the responsibility to come up with punishment for what Israel has done, you couldn't approximate what we just read here. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. But it wasn't sufficient. So future generations, he's written this for our admonition. So if this is how you, if this is how you try and correct the behavior of people, if this is how, make it tough for them, be really nice to them. If this is the tactic you take, we got Israel. God is really nice to them. Took them out of Egypt, let them do the Red Sea, gave them manna, gave them water, gave them deliverance. Couldn't have been any nicer. Then he chases them. You couldn't have been chasing any worse than they were. I'd like to get up one morning and 30,000 people died that day. They had wiped out a good, a better, more than 50% of the population of Joplin. Wiped out in a day. Hmm? So you can't, you, you couldn't conceive of you doing any more than was done here, but it didn't turn the people. That's what sin does to people. Well, he doesn't, he doesn't quit. I, I have, see, this, these are things he's already done. I have overthrown some of you. And that, that's a blessed thing right there. I overthrew some of you uh, as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. How would you like to be likened to Sodom and Gomorrah? Some Israelites were able to see how God judged his people. Some saw what God had done. In Nehemiah's day, the people said, We have sinned against these. Yeah, they saw it. They saw it. The psalmist said in Psalm 106, 6, We have sinned with our fathers. We have committed iniquity. We have done wickedly. See, they, they saw it. Isaiah said, who gave Jacob for spoil and Israel to the robbers? Did not the Lord? He against whom we have sinned, for we would not walk in his ways, neither were, we obe neither were they obedient to his law. See, Isaiah saw it. He's, he saw it. See, I, I overthrew some of you. These we read, but we just read about here. They, he didn't overthrow them. Jeremiah lamented, the crown has fallen from our head. Woe unto us that we have sinned. Lamentations 5.16. Daniel said, we have sinned, have committed iniquity, and have done wickedly, and have rebelled even by departing from the by precepts and thy judgments. See? Now, all the prayers for America may sound good, but until somebody confesses we have sinned, there are just so much hot air. These people knew that, so they confessed. But he said, I, I did overthrow some of you. Everybody didn't. To compare you to Egypt and Sodom, see, so far he's compared the disobedient ones to Egypt and to Sodom, two of the worst incidents in Scripture. Amos is not writing here to a heathen nation. He's writing to Israel. Now, the, what he's saying, I overthrew some of you. All right, stated another way, I left a remnant. Yeah, yeah that's, that's saying the same thing another way. And in that way, they differed from Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah. Now, Isaiah made a point of this. Compared Sodom and Gomorrah, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah with Israel. Sodom and Gomorrah 
were wiped out. Israel, some, some of you. Here's what he said. Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant. We should have been as Sodom, and we should have been as Gomorrah. And Paul quotes that text in Romans 9, 29, to prove that Israel, God's not done with Israel because he left a remnant. Amen. He was done with Sodom, yeah. so he didn't leave a remnant. He was done with Gomorrah, so he didn't leave a remnant. But he left her. I overthrew some of you. The reason for sparing him was because he was going to be true to the promises he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Right. Now the prophets make a point of this. Second Kings 13, 23. The Lord was gracious unto them, had compassion unto them. He only, only took some of them. Had compassion upon them, had, had respect unto them because of his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yes. And would not destroy them, neither cast he them from his presence as yet. That's why he made a promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yeah. And in remembrance of that, he just overthrew some of them. Amen. Now, the some happened to be the majority. One place Paul said, what if some did not believe? Right. Well, 601,000 didn't believe and two did believe. So the sum wasn't the two. The sum was, in that case, with the 601,000. When we moved here from uh, Indiana, Ada rode with me, and uh, each car was loaded up with stuff. So she, so she rode with me, and she, she told me, now, Mommy told me to ask you questions and talk to you to keep you awake. So here's my question. She said, uh, how come he said some uh, didn't believe? I said, well, that's a simple, that's a simple mathematical thing. An unbeliever counts as zero. And 601,000 zeros is still zero. And one times two is two. <laughs> so that satisfied her, and we talked about other things. Then he says to them, you were like a firebrand, ye, plural, ye were like a firebrand plucked out of the burning. In other words, and say a firebrand snatched from the blaze, like it was a, a, a blazing fire. Generally speaking, it is... Generally speaking, Israel was the firebrand. But it was scarred and charred. Yes. When it was taken out of the fire, it wasn't a nice green twig uh -huh. Uh -huh. plucked from the burning. It was plucked from the burning. Right. But there was some aftermath upon it. The smell of smoke probably was on them. Now, there's been uh, times in history when the church has made uh, kind of a recovery yeah. from a long period of uh, delusion, like the Reformation movement. Although they were snatched from the fire, they had some scars, lingering scars, and some blackened parts. Sometimes took years and centuries to get over it. See, the fact you were snatched from the burning, we were snatched from the burning too, plucked out of the fire. That doesn't mean you come out without any scars or anything. Some of us found out some of this, we've had scars so deep, we didn't know how deep they were. I've been out of, out of that wretched system for well, well, many, almost 60 years. And I still, there's some remnants like lingering in the corners. I spot them every once in a while. I said, goodness, some of that, that's the result of being in the fire. Uh -huh. Amen. Yes. 
You've experienced this. I mean, if you've if you've made some kind of recovery, come back to the Lord, or whether you've come out yeah. of an erroneous system, you know that there's there was an effect that that had on you, but it didn't consume you. That's what plucked out of the fire means. God didn't let it consume you. Yes. Paul even had these scars. I persecuted the church of God. See, that was some of that, right. that some of that carbon from the fire yeah. still on his soul. Then he says this again. Yet ye have not returned unto me. That's the fifth and last time that Amos uses that language. He confirms us the mighty work that has been done by God when somebody returns. Oh, no wonder there's no wonder the father threw a feast when the prodigal son come back. No wonder, <laughs> no wonder when you realize what it takes to come back. It's a great work of God. person who Satan has taken captive when they're rescued? Well, a person who rescues them has to be careful. Galatians 6, 1. He said, consider yourself now. Ye that are spiritual, restore such a one, but consider yourselves. Be, be careful. You're playing with fire. And Jude warned people of the same same thing. Save with fear. Others save with fear. Not that doesn't mean scare them into heaven. That means you be a, you're, the fear is to be in you. You're getting close to this person who bottomed out. He's 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 when the sins wallow. He's wallowing in sin. You you have fear. You're some of this stuff doesn't get on you. Hate even the garment spotted by the flesh. You may say, well, at least I didn't. They didn't drag you back into it, but they got a spot on you. Hmm. See, some people, they don't know these things. They're, they're spiritually naive, and they, it's not preached very much. And so in their effort, a legitimate, very real effort, to try and save someone, lo and behold, they get the spot on themselves. Yeah, right. And eventually it becomes their undoing because they didn't know this. I say that because you've got to see it yeah. takes a lot for somebody to come back. Yeah. A white cloth never did clean up a mud puddle. That's right. That's right. Amen. And he states it again. Yet have you not returned unto me. So that's why Paul, he's talking about people that have been overcome by the devil. He gives them advice now that it, it hasn't always been heated, but this, it should be. He said, now the servant of God must not strive. Don't just be arguing about everything. But be gentle unto all men apt to teach, patient in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If, for adventure, God will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. So you, you approach cautiously and with care, Give it, giving every advantage to the you can to the person. It may, maybe, maybe God will give him repentance. Yeah. You can't recover them. That's right. They got to recover themselves. Yes. That's the way the kingdom works. Amen. Amen. You can't carry people out. Yeah. They have to walk out. Yes. Amen. See, when the three Hebrew children were in the furnace, they walked out. That's right. And these people that are overtaken in a the fall, they got to walk out. And so that's why we approach them to give them every advantage. All right, that, now that's what he'd done already. What we just read, that's what he's done already. <laughs> now he says, therefore will I do. But he's not done. That was, that was just preliminary. Therefore will I do unto thee, O Israel. Therefore. That is, as a consequence of not returning to me, after I did all that, and you didn't return to me, as a consequence, now I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. That's what he's telling them. So you think that was something? You, 
You think, you think that was something when you just read about? Will you hear what I'm going to do? He told them already. He withheld rain from them. He caused it to rain on one city and not on another. He caused it to rain on one field and not on another. He made the people wander from city to city trying to find water, never being satisfied. He sent blasting and mildew to them. He smote their crops when they increased with palmer worms. He sent pestilence among them. He slew their young men with a sword. He took away their horses. The stench of death filled their camp. He overthrew some of them, and as a charred stock, he snatched some of them out of the burning. Is that enough? No. I'm sorry, that wasn't enough. Now, some other things I'm going to do. Thus, see, because you didn't respond to that. You know, uh, we, of course, don't want to be overly critical and hunt for wrong and things like this. This isn't right. But when a person who once was identified to the Lord is a wallowing in sin, and a phenomenal amount of influence had been exerted upon him. God saw to it. This is how God is. They did, maybe you didn't say anything, but somebody did. Their conscience smote them. Hedges were thrown up. Way was hedged with thorns. God made it hard. So now, because I just listed 12 things he'd done already. He said, now thus will I do unto thee. Earlier he told him, when we first started, he told him, I will visit the transgressions of Israel upon them. See, so this he's going to, now he's going to go back to that, what he's going to do. He said, I'm going to, I'm going to visit the altars of Bethel. Remember he said that way back at the beginning, I will. And then he said, uh, I'm going to destroy your summer houses and your winter houses and your ivory houses and your great houses. I'm going to destroy them. I'm going to, I'm going to take your people away with hooks and, and your posterity with fish hooks. I'm going to just drag you out of the city by force, take you to another place. All of that's going to be fulfilled. Now, now, he, now he's taking that up. He's taking it up again. He told him what he's going to do, and I was going to do it. No more time to repent. No more talk. No negotiations. No more prayer. See, the Gentile world didn't learn this. God gave up on them. Romans 1 gave him over to Amen. gave him over to a reprobate mind. See? God's done this before. Happened in Noah's day, gave, gave up on him. Yep. Sodom and Gomorrah. Plain as Shinar. So there's examples of just no more was done. The point is that flesh cannot survive. Then he tells him. Prepare to meet thy God. Get ready. Up to this time, Israel had been dealing with God, but they hadn't seen God. They prepare to meet him. You're going to meet him now. The words, meet thy God, speak of face in God and knowing you are. Knowing it's God with whom you have to do. I know that with uh, when God... Judges, sinners, they're going to know what's happening. Yep. And they'll not be able to do anything about it. One time, Israel just saw a little of God's glory. His feet touched the mountain, and just a little, they were exposed to just a little glory. They were so averse to it. They said to Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us lest we die. See? 
No one's ever tried, when they knew they were facing God, no one's ever tried to negotiate with God. When they knew, that's what was going on. See, the trouble is people don't know their faith. They're dealing with God. They don't know this. Just like Israel, they didn't know they'd been dealing with God Almighty. Now God's going to get right up in their face. They're going to, going to deal with them. The point is that flesh can't survive immediate confrontation of the true God. People think Jesus is going to come back again and there's going to be an army marshal run out and fight him. <laughs> I mean, these people have to go back to kindergarten. No man can see me and live. And when Jesus comes back, he's coming back in glory. Not coming back like Jesus of Nazareth. God said to Moses, you can't see my face and live. But he's telling Israel... I'm going to deal with you, and you're going to know it's me. You better prepare to meet your God. Get ready. Now, of course, that the ultimate confrontation will be when Jesus comes again. That's going to be the ultimate confrontation. All men are going to meet God. For some who have taken advantage of his salvation, have been justified and sanctified, and now glorified, They'll say, this is our God. We've waited for him. He will save us. They'll be glad. That'll be our best. That'll be our happiest day. Amen. For the others, they'll cry for rocks and mountains to fall on them, but they, they won't do it. See, this is the church is a custodian of this knowledge. They've got to get this out. Someday, everybody is going to face God face to face without any flesh being around at all. He's not, Jesus isn't going to come till death's destroyed. See? When the dead are raised, no more, there's no more death in any sense. No more flesh in any sense. It's not there. Otherwise, you, every eye couldn't see him. You, Amen. Now, what are we doing? We're preparing to meet God. Yeah. Now, for us, this is a good exhortation. We're, we appreciate anyone that reminds us to do this. Yeah. But there are some people, they don't like to be reminded. Get up in their face and remind them. Right. You better be preparing now. Yeah. I've ministered to dying people that I had to tell that to. Hard people, hard people. You better be prepared. You're not going to be here much longer now. You better prepare yeah. to meet your God. The idea is you want to be able to survive the confrontation. <laughs> that's, the, that's the idea. We are glad to announce a gospel that will prepare you for that ultimate Amen. confrontation. So men do well to prepare for that day. It's all right there in the prophets, isn't it? Prepare. You sense that God's not going to let sin slide. And he's not going to let saints go unrequited and, unre and unacknowledged and unrewarded. Mm -hmm. He's not going to let that happen. Amen. So if it seems like now you're laboring, it almost seems like it's in vain. Your labor's not vain in the Lord. Amen. It's just piling up treasures on, <laughs> on the other side. When you meet God... The instant, that very instant, you're going to know it was worth it. Yeah. It was worth it. I think I'll close there, but that, there's just so much in this about God and Amos. You see it, the heart of God. You see the heart of God that he, he labors with the people. Lord right, Judah. The phrase, prepare to meet thy God, and the things preceding it, all the, to the level that God had gone to, in, in an attempt to bring them back, to turn to him, he withheld rain from them, he smote them with blasting and mildew, he slew their young, all, 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 this, all these things, and yet they still didn't turn back. Mm -hmm. That shows how hard they'd, they'd gotten, you That's mentioned right. this. There's, um... There's a nut called, it's called a walnut that has a 
tough outer shell when it falls from the tree. And, and you've got to do a lot yeah. to get through that shell to the actual meat of the nut. Yeah. It's, it's a crude example, but it does work. It's like these these things that he's already done with holding rain from them, the people wandering from city to city to try to find water, but never satisfying. It's like it's trying to be coaxed, at, it's trying to be coaxed out, trying to turn them back. I say this because he also brought upon them pestilence, like he did in Egypt. And when he had, when he did that in Egypt, the magicians recognized that this is only the finger of God. Yeah. You don't you don't do much with your finger. But God can do a lot with oh, yeah. only his finger. So this phrase, prepare to meet thy God, is like the hammer is coming down and you're not going to stop it. That's right. Because this is going to bring you to your senses and it's going to hurt. Because I have tried all of these things and left a remnant. Some of you I overthrew. He left a remnant, but you still didn't turn to me. Yeah. So all of this, these things that they've been doing, they've been piling up wrath, and now it's going to come flowing down on them. You, met, you also mentioned this. It's exactly the opposite for the believer. In so much as we give a believer, another believer a cup of cold water in my name, he notices it. So that's piling up for us too. When, and when we get to glory, it's laying up treasures for yourselves in heaven where moth nor rust can corrupt. That's when we'll be given a name that no other man knows. Amen. Mm -hmm. Yes, Sister Hannah. Um, when people are die, it starts to stink after a while. When a child of God dies in faith, they stink. And when something stinks, you must stay away from it, or you will stink. And that is why we stay away from sinners because they stink. And if we hang around them, we will fall away and stink. Mm -hmm. Good thinking. Just a barb. I was also comforted by the, your closing thoughts of our labors not being in vain. Because I thought about the labors that we expend on those who have less or more. Yes. There's been a lot of labors that the brethren have put yes. into them beforehand. Yes. Yeah. And I was considering that and, and almost uh, what Paul was saying to the, the Galatians about that labor being in vain. I was, I was almost mourning that fact. But the Lord said, your labor is not in vain when you labor for the Lord, when you're working together with Him. So we have a broader view now that the work that you were doing may have been providing these opportunities so that the Lord would be faithful in the judgment that He brought because of their yes, response right. to Him. Yes. Mm -hmm. Jesus actually spoke about that as well when He was speaking to uh, Capernaum. He said, if the mighty works done in you have been done in the Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have repented. They would still be here. Yeah. But it will be more tolerable for them than it is for mm. you now. Mm. Amen. So the refu refusing to listen is, in, in the day of the open heavens, is far worse than refusing to listen in, That's right. when there was much less revelation. Amen. Yeah, you know, you think about 9-11 and the tornado and the tsunami and you know how that disrupts the order of, of everyday right. life. It That's just right. it nothing's the same. It, it just like just let a person get sick, and and they and they, they they're in the hospital now, and they they know this there's something terribly wrong. They they're not thinking about. I wonder what the score on that sports game was. I, yeah. They're not thinking like that because it totally it disrupts the normality of Amen. life. Amen. And so, but God puts us in circumstances like mm -hmm. that. So. So he can deal with us now. He can work with us now. And yet, he says they didn't. They didn't. There was an opportunity there. It's a window. Yeah. When the window was passed, that bad things happen yes. after that. So, so you know, and he doesn't always do that. Sometimes he can just speak a word and you can hear it. Mm -hmm. And you can readjust. That's, a, that's obviously what, what would be best, to be able to hear, hear the word of the Lord rather than having to have some kind of terrible thing happened to you for him to get your tip. But if it does, we, we want to be quick to be able to, to readjust whenever the Lord gives us. He's, it says his, he was merciful to him, right? Yeah. It was a mercy. But they didn't listen. And now you, we're actually faced with a God who can come to the point to where there is no more repentance held out. No remedy. No remedy. Brother Jane? 
we currently live in a generation where preachers aggressively declare that you can always come back to God. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They use there's all kinds of language about you've never gone too far wow. and so forth and so on. So we shouldn't be surprised if, if we speak about these things. The nominal church people are going to say, what are you talking about? Yeah, Where did you get oh, that? Yeah. What? They'll say, what kind of a God do you serve mm -hmm. anyway? Yeah. They, they don't know this kind of a God. Yeah. They don't know God. Yeah. Amen. It's this part of his nature. It seems like once you see it, it seems like God has gone to a great extent to yes. show this aspect of his nature. Amen. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Mm. All right, we'll have a word of prayer. <clears throat> Our dear Heavenly Father, we pray that we would never be an, an occasion, never do anything that gives you an occasion to be angry or wrought up against us. We desire never to provoke you, Lord. Amen. We thank you for the sensitivity you've already given us, and we pray that you would, that you would increase it. We want to dwell in your courts. We know that when we're there, we're sensitized to your presence. Grant us this grace to always be in your presence, to always know that you're there, and to adjust ourselves and prepare to meet you. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>